our next video. Stay safe and healthy. The greatest tool that is used to control the masses and to keep us in the state that we are in is the divided state of our community, the generally divided state of our society. Each country is divided against each other, and then you break that down. Each state is divided against each other. Each community is divided against each other. Each person within the community is divided against the other people in the community, very often with their own families as well. And all of this is done by design. And even in the response to the system, the response is so divided because so many people have a focus on a particular rabbit hole or a particular agenda, and nobody is really willing to unite. So many people want to be the kingpin. So many people want to be the guru. And look, I can appreciate it. There's people out there that want to sell books, and we do need to make an income. We need to make a living because we have to pay to be alive. And, well, it may be an unfortunate thing, but it is an unfortunate reality. And we need to put all these differences aside. One of the most effective things the government ever did to hide the grand conspiracy that underlies all the other conspiracies was to create a conspiracy culture around it to hide the grand conspiracy. This is the best method that COINTEL has. It's one of their most effective methods. It's going to do every time. They will take a real conspiracy, something that is a real problem, and they will embellish it to the point that it becomes unbelievable, or they will surround it with all sorts of conjecture and innuendo and theory. And that's why there's been so many conspiracies interjected into the movement in the last 10, 20, 25 years, 30 years. I mean, it's been going on for a long time. If people are going to claim that the issue is the issue that will serve to awaken the masses and change the world, whatever the topic is, it first needs to be proven to be 100% true. And that has not and will not occur until mankind achieves the freedom to actually find out. But that freedom will never be achieved while people continue to argue.
Who's this? <clears throat> what the fuck? Whoa, whoa, what the, whoa. Hold on. Um, Okay, just so I'm clear, because... Um... There's my name. But you can't find it? Shut the fuck up. Um...
Who in the fuck has that name? <coughs> somebody, somebody's about to get busted right now. Watch this. conspicuous red color has fascinated man for thousands of years. By the end of 2018, there were eight active spacecraft either orbiting or investigating the surface of Mars. There are also private groups that boast they will be building the first colony on the surface of Mars. It's a human obsession that drives scientists, astronomers, explorers, and sci-fi writers mad. But why Mars? This passionate pursuit to discover life on the Red Planet may be fueled by something deeper than curiosity. It could be triggered by an ancient memory. If this is true, what is it we are trying to understand on the surface of Mars? The Electric Universe theory suggests that not only could there have been life on Mars, but it is one of the only planets that holds the most evidence that 10,000 years ago, an electrical encounter wreaked havoc on our current solar system. National Geographic published an article titled, Did Life on Earth Come from Mars? In the article, two scientists gather evidence that Mars had certain elements for early development of life that Earth seemed to be scarce of. Their theory suggests that a meteorite hit Mars and that the debris from that impact made its way to Earth's surface, carrying these elements we needed. This brings up two questions. If Mars had these necessary elements for life, could that mean that life existed on Mars already? And also, could this impact on Mars have been an electrical encounter with Earth and not a meteorite from space? Electric Universe unravels a riveting case for those questions. One of the big puzzles about the Earth has been its oceans because the hydrogen and oxygen that makes up the water in the oceans should have been, according to the standard theory, blown into the outer reaches of the solar system during the early phase of the sun's existence. And that was the argument for the formation of the gas giants. They're thought to be mostly the gases that were blown out from the inner solar system. The answer that they came up with is that the Earth suffered bombardment by comets and comets brought water to the Earth after its formation and the other planets that were in place. 
This doesn't stand up because uh, now that we've actually looked at comets, they don't have the water that was expected. And of course, the electric universe explains that too, because the water is actually formed electrically from the minerals on the surface. When we've looked closely at comets, uh, they've shown they've got rocky surfaces. The simple answer is that the atmosphere and the oceans on the Earth were formed by this continual misting down of material being lost from Saturn. That would mean that Mars also had the same environment. That also indicates that we should expect that there was life on um, Mars at that period. Holy and that shit. even after all that devastation, perhaps someday we may be able to detect the fossils of life forms. If Mars had the same environment as Earth, why did Mars end up a barren red planet while Earth continued to carry life? The breakup of the system must have consisted of a series of episodes, uh, some of them violent and destructive, others more benign. November 16th? Really? A chance no to fucking way. And regroup and figure out what they could do to <sighs> avoid being wiped out the next time. <sighs> that also gives rise to this idea of the recurrence and uh, you know, predicting it's going to happen again. Because in that era, the chances were pretty high. Each time these events occur, there would have been um, a change in atmospheric content, the amount of atmosphere, and those kinds of things. We know for certain that this also occurred on the Earth. On Mars being a small Four o'clock. The changes would have been Hold more on. dramatic, and it's possible that if there were people on Mars, they would have had to survive in a uh, reduced atmosphere, for November instance. November 16th? Oh, shit. That is right. These Never mind. These are the kinds of things that uh, one can speculate about and uh, try and form a picture of what these events must mean for living creatures on their surfaces. How is this explained using the Electric Universe model? Each of the satellites My, uh, of Saturn, Mars and Earth in particular, would have had to it. find their new place in the solar system. Now, under the Newtonian model, of course, this would have been uh, impossible in a short time frame we've been talking about, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago. In fact, it would have been impossible simply because having introduced chaos into the solar system, there's no way of restoring order. No simple way. Some bodies would have been flung out of the solar system, others crashed into others Dude, based no on the standard way. thinking. The electric universe model says that the bodies would avoid collisions, and when they came close, they would exchange electric charge, which would change their mass, their gravity, and therefore their orbit. So this is the mechanism that spaced all of the progeny uh. of proto-Saturn at the various distances that we find them in the solar system. There's research to be done to understand how this achieves what is known as the Bode's relationship between the orbits of planets. There are things going on in the electric universe which are not considered at present, and that is there are resonances. There are resonances within subatomic particles, there are resonances within atoms, within biological systems, within crystals, at every scale. And in the case of the solar system, Baptist Medical Center, a million views? I took that thing only in 2018. If this resonance between the planets caused... A mil over, what the hell? No way. Earth -like planet, Reached 300,000 views. Find evidence of that. What? I think it's that was last year. Visualize the towering what size the of the planet Mars as it neared the vicinity of the Earth. It would have been many times bigger than the current moon. But as Mars moved closer to the Do I need Earth, ideas? Let me see. To imagine unbelievable pyrotechnics in the sky. Uh, certainly a lot of electromagnetic effects, a lot of auroral effects. Mars at its closest was about 40 times the diameter of the moon in the sky. <sighs> you can understand the sheer fright and awe of the ancient observers and the concern that the things that were happening around them were signals of the, That's what I'm doing next? the world. Really? It also explains the strange motivation for ancients to build huge rock structures with uh, rocks that we'd have difficulty moving with our modern equipment. And some of them are very rudimentary. Um, they appear mainly to have shielded from things falling from above. And that fits, of course, with all of the stories of uh, stones falling from heaven. The meteorites that fell were associated with lightning. They were called lightning stones. So the two together came together 
the interplanetary lightning and the falls of rocks and stone and dust from the sky and also that fits with the biblical accounts of the plagues of Egypt and so on. If you have a situation where Mars meteorites are falling on the Earth in tremendous abundance, it goes without saying that there's a possibility that Mars microorganisms what did eventually that say? made their way to the Earth. Your reviews have over 36,000 views. Was recently discovered Your reviews have over... What, what the... the composition my reviews? The atmosphere is ...and what the rocks were made from. It was understood then that some meteorites that have been collected on Earth were actually from Mars. <clears throat> And not only that, that recently arrived ones amongst that discovery, which shows that there's still debris from the Martian sculpting arriving on Earth. What would this sculpting have looked like from the surface of Earth? Mars was the archetype of the warrior hero. The reason for that was that in this electrical environment, it was traveling between Venus and the Earth repeatedly. So it would retreat along the rotation axis of all the objects in this line, and it would move up towards Venus. Venus at that time was discharging in a greenish color, interestingly enough. But Mars, its red color was obvious. As it moved up towards Venus, it would sit within the green ring of Venus as if it was an eye with a red pupil. When it approached the Earth, there would be electrical activity which would make Mars move away and back down the column towards the Earth. And as it approached the Earth, it became gigantic and it was a threat to the Earth. Its appearance, as it got close enough, was such that material being removed from the surface of Mars electrically would descend towards the Earth and looking up at this descending material, it looked like a red dagger. So that globally you will see images of Mars and you will also uh, hear references to the sword of Mars. Well, what was the sword of Mars? It was this appendage of material, dust and gases, stretching towards the Earth, towards the northern pole, it seems. According to the ancient sources, a towering, gigantic tornado or hurricane descended from Mars uh, with disastrous effects. This wasn't a two-day phenomenon. This was a phenomenon that lasted for months, if not years. So it was remembered as a tremendous hurricane in the sky that circled around as a giant corkscrewing like serpent and affected a disaster but at the same time that same entity was looked upon as the single leg of heaven and or as the world pillar like structure that actually supported heaven in order for all those different thematic patterns to be associated with it it had to be a sustained phenomenon you know to allow that many different symbols to originate in the first place which would be visualized as a towering structure spanning the circumpolar sky above the earth virtually every culture on the earth commemorated that mountain in their monumental structures the maya pyramids for example are called mountains the pyramids of Egypt certainly would fall into that. The Babylonian ziggurats were certainly identified as a mountain. And those mountains were ascribed the exact same characteristics as the mountain in the sky. So they did not distinguish between the two entities. That mountain on the earth was the mountain in heaven. And probably the best example of that is the ziggurats in Mesopotamia, they typically included a bull's like horn on the top of the ziggurat. They compared that to the shining horns in heaven. We all are familiar with those ancient pictographs of the sun that we've been talking about. They will always have the sun setting within a crescent like horn. And so when that world mountain is putting a, a single set of horns on its apex, it is literally commemorating the horns that they saw in the sky, the Twin Peaked Mountain.
the search for planets beyond our solar system has brought a discovery of historic significance. Mars, the planet fourth from the sun and known for its conspicuous red color. So the United States government usage of the PRISM program, allegedly tracking over one million persons in the United States alone, has been particularly startling. Naturally, even if you don't think you're being tracked online, you are. Your internet service provider can see everything you do. While there probably isn't a guy sitting in a corner office watching your every move, many ISPs do compile anonymous browsing logs and sometimes sell them to advertising companies. News briefs bombard television sets and computer screens around the globe with cases of government whistleblowers, spying, cell phone hacking, private photographs leaked via iCloud, and more. Reports of the United States government usage of the PRISM program, allegedly tracking over one million persons in the United States alone, has been particularly startling. Naturally, growing interest and attention has been placed on privacy and security, not only in banks and boardrooms, but bedrooms and coffee shops around the world. Many want to avoid being tracked online, followed, spied on, and their information automatically gathered even if just to check on their Google searches, Skype calls, Facebook posts, or email messages. There are many ways to protect yourself from the prowling eyes of Big Brother and others who make a living following your every cyber move. But do keep in mind that nothing is 100% foolproof. You have to assume that scammers, spammers, and others spend their days and nights finding ways to make your online experience vulnerable and under constant threat. That doesn't mean you should succumb or act recklessly online, however. Just to be extra cautious, before we go any further, put a small strip of black electrical tape over your built-in computer camera. Hackers can remotely activate your webcam. Usually, you'll be able to tell it's been turned on due to the red light, but that's not always the case. There are techniques hackers and scammers use to avoid detection. Right now, there's definite cause for concern, because as many of you know, the Senate voted to permit internet providers to sell customers' browsing history without their knowledge or approval. Later that year, the FCC scrapped Obama-era net neutrality regulations, giving ISPs even broader control over the data traveling over their networks. Even putting aside the changing legal landscape, data is always vulnerable to hackers and almost certainly accessible to a government or law enforcement agency. If provided with a subpoena or a warrant from the police, your ISP is required to give up your browsing history. While we don't endorse doing anything against the law while you're online, there are many valid reasons why you should make it harder for interested parties to get access to your online activity. And the VPN is one of the most reliable. It's hard to protect your personal information on the internet with 100% effectiveness, but there are a few easy steps you can take that will make you a lot safer. According to Kaspersky Lab, these are certain ways in which you can manage your privacy and ensure that you are not tracked on the internet. 1. Click the Windows Start button and type CMD to launch the command window which will display as a black box with white text reading C colon backslash users backslash your username. Two, type netstat next to the prompt and press enter to generate a list of all outgoing data transmissions. The netstat command works best when you have as few applications opened as possible, preferably just one internet browser. The netstat generates a list of internet protocol, IP, addresses that your computer is sending information to. Some of these IP addresses are legitimate and correspond to websites or services that you are using. 3. Document each IP address reported by netstat and launch a web browser. Enter each IP address into your browser's address bar and press enter to attempt to locate where the information is being sent. 1. Right-click your taskbar and select Start Task Manager to launch your task manager. 
a list of all running processes on your computer. Two, close all programs except for one web browser. Three, select the processes tab, then select username and browse through the list to view all processes running on your computer. Processes that do not include your username may be an indication of malicious software running on your computer. Don't remain logged into your social media accounts all the while. You are easy to track if you are always logged into your social media account because you are letting the social media company know whatever you do on the internet. Once you are logged out, your surfing cannot be tracked by your social media company. In summary, your every move in the cyberspace is being tracked by someone or the other. It is up to you to ensure that all your security measures are in place. Otherwise, it is as simple as you allowing your personal information to be misused by a third party. Digitization has become an integral part of our life today. And most of the things that we do revolve around the internet. In all of these digital products, there is one that has now been integrated into every aspect of our lives. The way the world seems to be going, we almost cannot do anything without this digital giant, Google. Almost everything we use daily, Google Search, Gmail, Hangout, Play Store, Google Earth, Maps, Cloud Computing, and Advertisement. The platform was ranked as the most visited in October 2019, with up to 259 million visitors from the United States, a market share of 62.5% among the major search engine providers in the United States. Another research from the tribunal also found that Google receives more than 63,000 searches per second in a day. This is the average number of people using Google per day, equivalent to at least 2 trillion searches in a year, 3.8 million searches per minute, 228 million searches in an hour, and 5.6 billion searches within a day. These statistics show how Google has become so important and has managed to become part of our lives. However, the question is, are they really what they call themselves? Is Google doing us good? Or evil. Do we really have privacy using Google? In this video, I will be talking about Google and the CIA and the connections between the two. Therefore, prepare yourself as I take you through a journey through unknown things to the public in the past few years between Google and the CIA. <sighs> there is no way out. And as Larry Page and Sergey Brin cautiously discovered when they launched Google in 1998, everything people do on the internet leaves data. When properly stored and used, this data is a goldmine of complete information about people on a personal level, and valuable information about economic and political trends. Google was the first internet company to make the most of this information, and build a business based on the data that people leave behind. But it didn't take long. This has happened almost everywhere, from the smallest app to the largest platform. Amazon, Instagram, Tinder, Facebook, eBay, Uber, Spotify, Lyft, and Twitter. These platforms all leverage people's data, where we go, who we talk to, what we talk about, and who we see. All this information is recorded when you visit a place that you tell no one about. Google knows about it. They know us well including what we hide from friends and family. In our modern internet ecosystem, this private surveillance is the norm. But Google has grown so well, and no one wants to admit the fact that it has also grown worse over the years. However, it is Eric Schmidt became the CEO of Google in 2001. During his tenure as CEO, Google integrated with some power structures in the United States as it morphed into a geographically aggressive mega corporation. But Google has always liked this approach. Also, a long time before Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, hired Schmidt, their initial research on which Google relied was partially funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. And even Google under 
Schmidt has created an image as a very friendly global tech giant. It was secretly building a relationship with the intelligence community. In 2004, Google took over Keyhole, a mapping technology startup funded by the National Geospatial Agency, NGA, and the CIA. It was developed into Google Maps. The enterprise version of the Keyhole has even been shopped to the Pentagon and associated agencies under multi-million dollar contracts. These should raise a question on our minds whether there is a relationship between CIA and the tech giant. However, there have been many claims from Google that it was never funded or created by the Central Intelligence Agency. For example, when a story was circulating in 2006 about Google receiving funds from the intelligence community in the past years to help fight terrorism, the company told John Battelle, founder of Wired Magazine, that the statements related to Google are completely untrue. The big question now is, did the CIA fund Grid and Page's research and thus create Google? No, but were they researching exactly what the NSA, CIA, and the intelligence was hoping for? Absolutely. Grid's breakthrough research on page ranking by tracking user queries and linking them to the many searches conducted, essentially identifying birds of a feather, was largely the aim of the intelligence community's MDDS program, and Google succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. To understand this, you need to think about what the intelligence community was trying to achieve by providing grants to the best in academia. The CIA and NSA funded an unclassified, diverse, but elaborate program from the beginning to encourage the development of something that is almost like Google. The investment arms of the Central Intelligence Agency and Google support a company that monitors the internet in real time and reported it uses the information to predict the future. This seems to be the first time that the intelligence community and Google are funding the same startup at the same time. No one accuses Google of cooperating directly with the CIA, but the investment is bound to feed Google's critics who see the search giant as already very friendly with the United States government and fear that the company is starting to forget its mantra. Don't be evil. Television, radios, and mobile phones are all functioning as communication technologies, thanks to radio waves, which are a type of electromagnetic radiation. When a device receives radio waves, it then transforms it into mechanical vibrations in the speaker in order to create sound waves. Probably one of the most controversial subjects regarding communication technologies and how their development influences the human life is the mobile phone. And this is due to the newest and, as many have described it, the worst aspect of technological evolution, 5G. Once mobile communication technologies were introduced, there were a number of significant worrying comments as to how real the potential health risks are associated with the use of mobile phones and living near base stations. The new 5G network that the ultimate trend in mobile phone technologies are using creates radio frequency electromagnetic fields that are needed in order to transmit information. While advertised as a tool to make our lives much easier, history shows that the use of EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies, has led to numerous dubious effects during the Cold War when Russians basically bombarded the United States Embassy with non-ionizing microwave radiation. For a total of 40 hours a week, frequencies starting from 2.5 gigahertz and going up to 4.0 gigahertz were aimed at the American Embassy, and the consequences were several times detailed in current research. According to very popular reports from the Lilienfeld study and the Moscow signal, it seems that even though the radiation intensity was 500 times less than the United States standard for occupational exposure, the embassy was still beamed with twice the highest limit allowed by the Soviet standard. The effects on the people working at the U.S. Embassy were depression, irritability, concentration problems, memory loss, 
ear, skin, and vascular problems, along with other health issues, according to Dr. Paul Dart, MD, who studied the health effects of smart meters. The 5G network we are all about to welcome into our lives uses the same range of 2.5 to 4 gigahertz as the one beamed by the Soviets. When the CIA was in charge with investigating whether there were significant changes to the nervous system once exposed to such electromagnetic frequencies, their results showed how the Soviets attempted to achieve mind control by using a low-level radiation. This was found in the Foreign Policy magazine, which also mentioned that, wanting to understand what was actually going on, the U.S. did not tip off the Soviets that they were aware of the irradiation. So this led to the daily exposure to radiation of the diplomats, who were also kept in the dark. The secret project of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects, known as Project Pandora, went deeper into researching how behavior could be impacted by exposure to microwaves, yet no relevant biological health impacts were made official. This secrecy led to a significant number of staff dealing with serious health issues, and the consequences did not avoid high officials, because three of the American ambassadors to Moscow died of cancer. Two of them died before 1976, and the third died of leukemia in 1986. So this was DARPA Program Plan 562, which is better known by its code name, Project Pandora, the exploration of the behavioral effects of microwaves and one of the most dubious episodes that the history of Cold War science went through. What the Soviets used in Moscow were microwaves and radio frequencies that a 1971 study carried out by the Naval Medical Research Institute documented as leading to a number of biological impacts, such as cataract lesions, burns at the site of surgical implants, such as pins, liver enlargement, poor fertility in men, alterations in fetal development, significant impacts on the nervous system, like headaches, insomnia, restlessness, cranial nerve disorder, seizures, and convulsions, psychophysiological disorders such as depression, anxiety, a general feeling of lousiness, dizziness, fatigue, irritability, chest pain, memory loss, and tremors. A number of other health issues related to biochemical, metabolic, gastrointestinal, and endocrine gland factors were also found. The carcinogenic effects of such waves and frequencies were detailed by Dr. Neil Cherry, a New Zealand environmental specialist. It seems that the embassy staff dealt with brain tumors, leukemia, and reproductive organ cancer. This is seen as a trigger effect of low-level chronic microwave exposure, which highly influences the increases in illness and mortality in organs across the entire human body. Also, there is noticeable widespread damage of cellular chromosomes. Even though all these studies, along with others, clearly showed the at least dubious effects of prolonged exposure to microwaves, officials could only conclude that no adverse health effects of the radiation were shown among the embassy staff members. And this position is still held on to, even nowadays, despite what research shows. It is still officially believed that microwave technology, like cell towers and phones, is safe even though time has shown significantly more evidence of the dangers that EMFs actually have. This new wireless revolution, which is the 5G, is thought to provide access to a planet-wide wireless system that will successfully go past 4G, its predecessor, in terms of how fast and more energy efficient this new network is announced to be. So, is it safe enough to be brought along in everyday human life? Some magazines would say that yes, it is. However, researchers disagree. Dr. Ben Ishai, member of the Hebrew University Department of Physics, explained in more detail this phenomenon during the 2017 Environmental Health Trust Forum. He came up front with evidence that the 5G technology will interact with the human skin and the sweat glands, and that it will seriously affect oxygen metabolism. The skin is absorbing, and the main, if you like, motivator of that absorption would be the sweat duct. This is all before we'd even realized that these industry standards were going to come out for 5G. 
Now, there is a problem at around about 550 gigahertz, strong absorption line from oxygen. He went further, claiming that there is much more research on human health effects that must be done before this new wireless technology is implemented. According to him, this is a mandatory step to take before anything, because this is how both the public and the environment are protected. The same opinion is shared by the president of the Environmental Health Trust, Dr. Deverett Davis, who believes that this is all part of an uncontrolled experiment aiming to impact the human population. She adds that as long as one looks out for a faster downloading of movies and games, there is no opposition in volunteering one's living body to such a global experiment. So there are still questions that need an answer. As a society, should we agree with investing hundreds of billions of dollars in deploying 5G? Should we agree with the installation of 800,000 or more new cell antenna sites throughout the United States, close to households, workplaces, or play spaces? Since approximately 250 scientists and medical doctors signed the 5G appeal that requires an immediate moratorium on deploying this new network, and that more research must be done before installing it, you be the judge of whether this technology is working for us or against us. Hour. And interestingly, Super Bowl turn. Good afternoon, everyone. Conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn coming up December 21st, 2020 in the solstice. A shifting of the ages not seen since 1226 AD in the Middle Ages. Moving signs in astrology from Earth into air. A once in a 700 year plus cycle. At the same time, this brings us into the true dawning of the age of Aquarius, the first minute and the first degree moving through the procession of the equinoxes into a new sign, Aquarius. At the same time, descending into the grand solar minimum, an overlapping of three cycles. The media coming out with super bolts detected above. Lightning 100x more intense than what we see from the ground level. And maybe you'll understand that the Great Reset in the World Economic Forum is not because they care about us, but to set up the power structure in air so they still remain in power after the changes. As Americans seek economic protection after the most controversial election in U.S. history, year to date in 2020 alone, gold is up 30 percent and silver rising more than 50 percent. And now we're entering a new year facing economic realities of a global economic crisis caused by COVID and political reactions. Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or physical silver. And the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer five years in a row from 2016 to present. To find more information, the link's in the description box below. And now on with the video. And if you're feeling a little bit energetically strange, things are unwinding around us. I can explain it the best of my ability in this video. Jupiter and Saturn are going to align conjunction. It happens every 20 years, which is a cycle in itself of 20 years. But in multiple cycles of those, they bring in the change of an age in the elements, a mutation from Earth into air. 
Now, the last time the mutation or the change of the element took place was the Middle Ages. 1226 is where we need to go back to with the closeness of Jupiter and Saturn in this conjunction, along with the shift of an element. So rare is this that it would bring on a changing of an age on our Earth anyway, a denser medium being replaced by a lighter, faster medium, cryptocurrency, decentralized economy, work from home. All these things are being forced upon us. We're not chosen to do this, but the power brokers across the planet, if you look at Earth, It looks like a pyramid. It's a mountain. That was the traditional structure of control top down. This will no longer function in these new energies we're moving into air, creativity, a different kind of power for the individual. And these elitists know they cannot retain power with the same structure. So they're forcing the change to create the new foundation for themselves to stay in power. The Great Reset. Do you think that all this is a coincidence that it's happening right now? You're being forced into this whether you want to or not. As I heard it put, millionaires, they don't look at astrology, but billionaires do. We're ending a uniting of the earth signs. We're moving in. The lightning bolts of Jupiter will not only bring about a destruction of old societal structures, but will impel us to release personal dreams and drama we've been attached to beginning of a new era we wanted to make space in our lives do you notice how they're trying to take away remove things from our lives set up the foundation for the new things coming into our lives where these elitists will still try to retain power and interestingly super bolts are now in the news on the 24th here just a few days back headlines about electrical activity 100x brighter than what we can see as normal lightning bolts With the energetic changes sweeping across our solar system, the supercharged electrical connections back to the sun, front and center here. Why are they telling us about the super bolts? This is one bolt lasting nearly seven seconds, covering hundreds of miles across the southeast U.S., but now there's thousands of these. One in every 300 lightning strikes is turning into this right now. What is it about the change in electroplasma around us, around our planet, discharging back to the sun as it steps down in its 400-year cycle as well? And another cycle lapping on top of this is the biggest one, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. We've heard this since, what, 1960s? We heard it again in the year 2000, the age of Aquarius. But here it is, truly, coming into the very first minute of the first degree out of the circle of 360 degrees transiting through the procession of the equinoxes we are literally changing the sign on the 21st this is going to bring us into a new energetic frequency as well this conjunction is the first minute of the first degree taking us across the 26,000 year cycle through the heavens that the mayans were so famous in referencing on how the energies would change across the planet as the pole stars would also change through this 26,000 year cycle and the grand solar minimum diving into its low cycle all on top of this, the regular 20 year Jupiter Saturn conjunction overlapping on the grand solar minimum 400 year cycle on top of the change of the elements on a 700 year cycle intertwined with a 2,120 year cycle all happening, all beginning on the 21st of December, 2020. This is the most important time for us as a human on this planet. The pro-human future is in front of us. The energies we can harness and use as a united human front and kick the darkness back and say, no, thank you. And in the cycle of energetic change, Kick the darkness back for another 12,000 years. See you next time.
Good afternoon, everyone. David Dubine here for Mini Ice Age Conversations Podcast and Adapt2030.tv on Roku. The great shift being on, this is going to impact seed laws in Africa as well. Old treaty for seed and species protection, not good enough. Have to upgrade new 2020 agreement, which will include patenting of all plants and all animals. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership just signed also has the patenting of plant and animals at the very center of it, in addition to corporate concentration of all food and agriculture, governing 2.2 billion people. And the new update, breeders' rights. Any variety that you make from an existing other variety is illegal. You're never allowed to bring it to commercial production. And if they find you growing it on your private farm, the gray area is they could confiscate your land and your machinery, and onto a lighter subject, a mouthless alien mask found in a calcolithic period, Bulgaria 6,000 years ago, looks remarkably similar to the engineer from Prometheus. And reading through the financial news, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup all now say this is the time to buy gold. Even Bank of America and Merrill Lynch are forecasting gold to go to $3,000 an ounce over the next 12 months. And now that the election's over, we have clear signs from analysts that gold and silver is preparing to soar to new highs. So get ready for a phenomenal surge in precious metals prices through 2021. A gold IRA uses the value of precious metals to keep you out of trouble. The team at Noble Gold knows how to do oh. this, and they've done it for thousands of other people before you. Don't let a sudden stock market, banking crisis, or currency reset wipe out your finances. And if you need an extra reason to jump on this, mention the Adapt 2030 channel and get a free one-ounce silver coin for answering a three-minute survey with Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer four years in a row. Grab the phone and give Noble Gold a call now. 877-646-5347. And you'll also find the link in the description box below the video. And as we move into 2021, and this seems to be a consolidated power play across the planet for food, resources, economy, human labor, and everything retooled and repooled for the elite. We're going to start over here in Geneva. International Union for Protection of New Varieties of Plants, UPOV. Sounds so innocuous. UPOV's mission is to provide and promote effective systems of plant variety protection with the aim of encouraging the development of new varieties of plants for the benefit of society. Really? Sounds good to me. Currently 73 members in green. And you have to abide by their laws of who owns what seeds around the planet. So with the African Sahel coming on as a new growing area for our planet, as other areas with a grand solar minimum go offline with crop production, all eyes are on Africa and the species available there, the biodiversity, and suddenly African nations are going to be forced to join a new convention, an upgrade from the Kanto Agreement, because the act in 2000 and then 2018, they both aren't good enough. There has to be a new World Trade Organization requirement for Africa to sign its rights away on all of its seeds, plants, and animal varieties. And according to UPAW, that's a benefit of society. I've linked everything in the description box below. This is one of the most important videos you will ever see from my channel about how food is being consolidated into the corporation hands of few. And this trade agreement's privatizing biodiversity. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait a second. Privatizing biodiversity? That should be the huge red flag in the title of this World Trade Organization document. But the Kanto Agreement, originally in 2000, is now being upgraded this year in 2020 to ensure adequate effective protection of patents on plants and animals meaning that a corporation can come in and patent any genome sequence of any animal or any plant on the planet. And if you use it, raise it like a pig, they already own the DNA sequencing and you are technically breaking patent infringement by raising an animal on your own land. This is what the upgrade's all about. 
scary to say the least. And now they're forcing, and I mean literally forcing every country across the planet to adhere to these new trade agreements. And just a spackling here, the PDF's amazing. By the time you end to read that PDF, your mind is going to be blown half open just from the Africa and Middle East, because we are talking about the Sahel, European Free Trade Association. See, then it comes into in force in Egypt. Now, the old ratification was 2007, but they're going to be strong arm thumb screwed into the 2020 agreements here where the patents must be provided in all fields of technology. They're obliged to join. So any country that's there has to allow corporations to come in and patent plants and animals. These fields to all technology must be open for all international players because it's an international agreement. And another must read article linked below is this basic primer on how companies intend to control and monopolize seeds in animal species. The patent shall give exclusive rights to selection achievement. So if they were to add one hair onto a pig and somehow you bought that pig from a breeder and now you want to have it on your farm and then you want to breed it instead of having two, you want four, you want, oh, wait a second. Now you're breeding, you're breaking the patent. They want you to pay for each successive generation of animals, even though you're using for home use and you originally bought the animal and the same with the plants. You're not allowed to save your own seeds anymore. Even local home gardeners could be in the gray letter of the law, breaking the patent, confiscation of your land and machinery. So you see where this is going to go with the Great Reset. Right now, all these people like myself getting out in the countryside, getting self-sufficient, but they're going to start using these laws right here to say, you're breaking the patents because you're growing the food and you're saving your seeds. You're not allowed to do that. And these animals and the chickens and the pigs and the goats that you have have already been patented by XYZ Corporation. And you coming into the second and third generation have broken international law. Thank you very much for your farm. Now, the EU and Japan is moving in the way. And then the U.S. got out of that Trans-Pacific Partnership four years ago. But this was also included in the text, along with the shipping and international manufacturing aspects of it. Because that also United Nations sponsored Barcode of Life Project is to DNA sequence and map every species on the planet. 20 million plant animal, insect, fish, the entire biome to put it into a real-time AI. They call it biosurveillance system. This comes right on the heels of that. They're intertwined, actually. And what I found so interesting is the way they broke down the plant kingdom, the species, and the variety. I can't say whether the new 2020 act is going to be an upgrade of the person who discovered the variety. Because as the letter of the law writes... I could just wander into Africa somewhere, find a seed that has not been identified or put into the system, which is an entire regulatory body and so much money. And it's an enormous hurdle for even well-to-do farmers to jump in to this system of patented seeds and protected varieties, let alone an agrarian-based subsistence farmer. Are you kidding me? So I can walk into a marsh somewhere in Africa, say, hey, I found this wild rice species i discovered it it's mine now every african has to buy the seed from me because i discovered it now i'm wondering if this is going to be an update here in 2020 but for sure up until today 1991 act allows that any person any company or an employer of the indiana jones of seed raiding across africa that's one part of it but the scariest part is the breeders right does not extend to creating new varieties derived from other protected varieties. And I'll bring it to you in the United States here. Let's use apples for an example. Okay, there's probably 20 varieties of apples that are on the commercial scale end of things. Fuji, for example, would be a famous one and already in this stream of protected varieties. Now, or if I were to come and then crossbreed that with, say, a plum or some other variety of a wild apple and I use one of the cultivars, that is not allowed any longer under the 2020 agreement. 
as my own purpose of breeding another variety because it came from the source variety. So what happens in 2020?